What's up? And welcome into Fantasy Baseball today on Wednesday, March 6th. I am Frank Stanfield, joined by Scott White and Chris Towers. Today on the show, Breakouts 2.0. Scott just wrapped up his Tout Wars Industry Draft, which is a 15-team 5x5 roto with OBP instead of batting average. And we will break that down later on. But Scott, you're fresh off the draft. Give us a quick, I don't know, one minute or less, Spark Notes version. How you feeling? Uh, I wish I was feeling better than I am. Uh, uh, I, I think I got off to a great start and uh, just kind of kind of got off track in the middle. Went re- I went really heavy at starting pitcher and outfield early, and then I ignored it for way too long. And um, now I'm going to have to pick up one player off the waiver wire to fill each of those spots for week one because I drafted a certain number of injured players. They're infinite IL spots and in tout war. So opposite end of the spectrum from TGFBI or NFBC where there are no IL spots. So uh, it's not as bad as it sounds that, you know, I have all those injured players, but it's uh, it's not ideal. Mm, all right. Well, we'll get to it a little bit later on. Let's start off with additions to breakouts 2.0, which are almost all live on the site. My Breakouts 2.0, Chris's are there. Scott's will be up next week. And Chris, we will start with you, in addition to Breakouts 2.0, that you are most excited about. Yeah, I'm going to go with Tristan Casas, who the breakout case is mostly just do what you did in the second half. He hit 305 with a 996 OPS from July 1st on with a 40 homer pace. Just do that. The quality of contact metrics are all very good. He was very good against lefties, albeit in a 97 plate appearance sample size. I think Tristan Casas legitimately could hit 290, 300. And I think he could be a 35 homer, 40 homer guy on the high end of his outcomes. Like this was a an elite, elite prospect coming into last season. He got off to a somewhat slow start. The underlying metrics always suggested he was going to break out. Then he did. He doesn't really have too many glaring red flags in his profile. If I had to pick one, it's probably just that he's a lefty at Fenway Park, which is going to make hitting that homer ceiling a little tougher, but it's also going to make the batting average easier to to hit. So I I think there's a lot of way that ways that this season turns really, really right for Tristan Casas. And I think there's a chance we're talking about him as a legitimate top 25 hitter in fantasy next season. The ADP for Casas, according to Fantasy Pros, is 97 as the 10th first baseman off the board. He is going right around Spencer Steer. I assume we would all rather have Tristan Casas over Spencer Steer, correct? Oh, yeah. Regardless of format, right? Yes. Cool. Doesn't matter the format, no. Uh, I did have Tristan Casas in breakouts 1.0. So I was ahead of you on this one, Chris. Thank well, that's why you much. couldn't steal him this time. That's why I couldn't. But um, yeah, so I actually think he might be as well suited for Fenway Park as a left-handed hitter can be because his power is so good to the opposite field. Mm-hmm. And, like he's kind of Freddie Freeman-like in that way. And it, like in a few ways, that was, that was one of the comps for him coming up through the minors and um, certainly had a slash line that was Freeman-esque in the second half last year. Um, the biggest concern would be, are they ready to play him literally every day? He was playing more against lefties in the second half, but they have, they have uh, options that they could choose to platoon him more than we'd like if, if they choose. And the other concern just from a strategizing perspective is I don't, I wouldn't say Tristan Casas is going for much of a discount Mm -hmm. and that's not, I think essential for breakouts discussion, Mm -hmm. but I have yet to have an opportunity to draft Casas uh, because one of my sleepers, Vinny Pasquantino, who I think profiles similarly, I don't, not quite the same upside, but uh, you know, he tends to go three, four rounds later. So I, I wish I had more Casas, but he's he's been kind of a difficult fit for me based on where he's going, based on how others are valuing him. The batting average was lower against lefties last year for Casas, just 215, but he did walk a ton against them, nearly mm-hmm. a 19% walk rate, 
That's a 361 on base percentage. He had an 817 OPS against lefties. So his uh, expected Woba was 340 against them. He, he yeah. like he, the underlying numbers, the quality of contact was was quite good as well. Yeah. So the hope is that he improves against lefties, gets to play every day, could have a huge season coming here for Tristan Casas. Scott, let's move over to you. Breakouts 2.0. All right, let's go with Christopher Morell, who I didn't really consider for Breakouts 1.0. In fact, I had him buried in my rankings because I didn't see where the opportunity was for him in the Cubs lineup. They, they don't seem to like his defense. He played a lot of DH last year, mostly DH. Um, their outfield, as, as, even before bringing back Cody Bellinger, their outfield appeared to be full. So I, I wasn't sure where the at-bats were going to come for Christopher Morel, but lo and behold, they've decided to make him their third baseman. Way to go, Craig Council, on that decision. He's still auditioning for the, the, the role technically, and I, I haven't heard many reports about his defense at third base this spring. Uh, so there's a chance it, it doesn't happen, I guess. But that does very much seem to be the Cubs' wish for him and the Cubs' plan for third base heading into this season, considering that their only alternatives really are uh, Nick Madrigal or Patrick Wisdom, neither of whom we need to see more from. And uh, I guess they could slide Michael Bush back over there if they had to, but that doesn't sound like it's in the discussion. So it, it really seems like they're putting all their eggs in the Chris Christopher Morrell at third base basket. And so what does that mean in terms of what he could he could do for fantasy? Well, his average exit velocity last year, 91st percentile. His barrel rate, 95th percentile. His hard hit rate, 92nd percentile. His expected slug, 85th percentile. He's one of those hitters who you go to his stat cast page and certainly in the most important bars, it's all it's all it's all lit up in red. It's it. It looks like Steve Urkel's report card. Is it, it's a lot say. of red when he makes contact for sure. The contact is an issue, yes, but not. It, it's like thirty percent strikeout rate. It's 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 what we know in these modern times of stat cast readings. A hitter with his profile can overcome that strikeout rate because the quality of contact is so high. And you just look at his per game production over the last two years. There have been some extreme highs and lows, very streaky hitter. Mm -hmm. um, and it's possible he slumps so badly that he gets removed from the lineup at some point, I guess. But uh, 26 home runs in 107 games last year. That's, that's obviously uh, a lot of upside for fantasy. Um, he had six stolen bases too, for whatever that's, that's worth 87. 82nd percentile sprint speed. So he he could he could maybe have 15 to 20 steals, at least a dozen. And uh, he'll be picking up third base eligibility in addition to outfield. So, um, you know, I just had my Towers draft, as you pointed out, Frank. I drafted Christopher Morell as my fourth outfielder in round, uh, what was it? In round 15. And uh, Rudy Gamble, great, great player for Rasball. He said uh, he had his eye on him there, too. So there you go. Yeah, the comp we've made in the past, and I still think it's apt, is the sub-peak Javier Baez season. So not the year he almost won MVP, but the other years when he was, like, consistently in the, you know, 25 to 30 homer range, consistently in the, the low teens in stolen bases, I think – that's the kind of production you could realistically expect from Christopher Morrell. Yeah, the ADP for Morrell, according to Fantasy Pros, 197.2 as the 47th outfielder off the board, going right next to another name that I know Chris and I both like. Not so sure about Scott, actually. Jaron Duran, Scott. Who would you rather have, Christopher Morrell or Jaron Duran? Well, it depends if I need power or speed at that point, I guess. If I need batting average at that point. Um uh, yeah, I have them right next to each other in my rankings too. There, there was I, I saw there was something new about uh, Durant he, today. He left today's game with a, an ankle injury. Okay, which so, was well, scary at first because he was like flexing his foot during the at bat. But right, it's it's the ankle, not the toe. This right, was his it was third a bad game back. Toe. So yeah, it was and a bad toe like coming in. He'll be back in the lineup on Thursday. That's yes. okay. So no big deal. Yeah, I, I think it's just totally a need based thing. It, if it's a points league, you probably go. Duran because Morel strikes out so much. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, yeah, they deserve to rank in the same vicinity. All right. In addition for me to breakouts 2.0, Seiya Suzuki, the ADP is 112.6 as the 26th outfielder off the board. And he's delivered flashes of brilliance. We've yet to see it over a full season yet. So last year was kind of a weird year for Suzuki. Delayed start to the season due to an oblique injury. He returned and he hit well through May and then just completely lost it in June and July. A two-month span where he hit 212 with a 578 OPS. Then manager David Ross uh, said Suzuki was, quote, in between with his swing. He got a few days off for like a mental break. And early... Uh, early in August, after that happened, all systems go, final 47 games, triple slash, 356, 414, 672, with 11 home runs and a 13% barrel rate for Say Suzuki. I think all the tools are there. Strong plate discipline. He hits the ball hard. 79th percentile sprint speed. He has been very inefficient on the base paths so far, but he is fast enough to steal 10 to 15 bases. So uh, I think it all comes together this year. Hits 280 plus. 25 to 30 homers, 10 to 15 steals, and really helps you regardless of format, right? The plate discipline is strong, and I think he'll play up well in a head-to-head points league as, as well. So I'm in on Seiya Suzuki and, and happy to get him usually as like my outfield two or maybe outfield three in a shallower league. Any thoughts? He was in my breakouts 1.0 as well. Ah, I'm, glad, I'm glad you guys are seeing things my way now. Uh, I, I'll just add on Seiya Suzuki. I mean, you mentioned how... how the late surge completely turning around to season long numbers. But in addition to that, uh, his manager at the time, David Ross um, said he felt like the turnaround was more like a mental thing than a, than like a mechanical thing or, or a physical thing. Just like he seemed like he started to have fun finally. And I, you know, I just wonder considering he was coming over from Japan where he was a star and, um, you know, he was delivering quality exit velocities his first year and a half in the majors. And it seemed like, okay, why, why is say Suzuki not performing better? And it's just, he finally got comfortable in a very different world than the one he was used to. And, um, if so, then I think that's all the more reason to think he could sustain it. Not exactly the 350 batting average or whatever it was over the final two months, but something, something more along those lines. Yep, and uh, put the money where the mouth is. I got him in NL Labor last week for, I think, $20. So I'm in. Let's go. Say a Suzuki, baby. Quickly promote a few things. Make sure to sign up for our FBT newsletter if you haven't already. That's cbssports.com slash newsletters. Click on that FBT logo. Punch in your email address. It's easy as that. It's free. If you're watching us live on YouTube, scan that QR code. That will take you right to the website where you can sign up. And Chris does great work. So you want to support him, support us, make sure to sign up for that newsletter. And a reminder that we are now accepting submissions for our two FBT listener leagues. So the dates for those, again, 12-team head-to-head points league. The draft will be Tuesday night, March 19th. Some people have emailed in asking what time. 9 o'clock, 9 p.m. Eastern time. Does that sound good, Scott? We could draft at 9. Uh, Sure. For the listener yeah, league. Yeah. I got nowhere to be. Yeah, just, just making sure. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's the 12 team points league. And then our for the people head to head categories league. That is a 16 team league that will draft one week later, Tuesday, March 26th. Again, probably around 9 p.m. Eastern. Well, let's say eight. Eight. P.m. That one is a 16 team league, you know? Okay. Uh, eight or 9 p.m. It'll be in the <laughs> evening. So somewhere around then, send us in something creative. Fantasy baseball at cbsi.com. That's the letter I. Uh, put FBT Listener League in the subject line. Again, send us in a song, a Photoshop, a poem, just a reason why you deserve to be in the league. Anything that you got, a, a funny story, whatever. It Money. Might be. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll work too. Uh, Chris also went out and said that he will be will create a parody of the best song submission that comes in. Do I have that right? Uh, yes. Send in it, it, send in some song parody. Uh, suggestions with lyrics and uh, you know, I'll, I'll go through them and, and I'll pick my favorite one and we'll, we'll get that person in. So, you know, tailor it to me. Nineties alternative rock is probably your best bet. I will announce the winners on Monday, March 18th. So you have a little bit less than two weeks to get those in. Um, so good luck to all. 
and uh, we appreciate the support. Let's talk some news and notes. Another day filled with injuries. Here we go. Justin Verlander will begin the season on the IL due to that right shoulder issue that he's been de dealing with. JP France will be the Astros' fifth starter in the meantime. And uh, we knew Verlander was dealing with this. We didn't know he would actually start on the IL. Now we have that confirmation. Have you guys lowered Verlander in the rankings? I I lowered him before this because I was I, I think I was the most concerned about his shoulder. I, I'm actually less concerned about it now uh, because it sounds like he's been throwing without any setbacks. He had a 60 pitch bullpen session over the weekend and felt no pain or discomfort afterward. He's just behind schedule. And so I think that that creates a value opportunity. In fact, uh, this was something that kept happening in my towers draft. It's going to be a, this is going to be a one time at band camp kind of podcast, I guess. <laughs> um, this happened so many times where I had a pitcher I wanted queued up and he was so close to coming to me at pick 15 and he got yoinked at the last second. And that happened with Verlander. He went too late. He went round 15. My gosh, mm. 15 could have been mine. Yeah, I think he went around there in my TGFBI draft as well. And I, I just think that's an obvious value. I get moving him down, but he's still like a top 125 pick for me. That's pick 225. Yeah, that's, where he went that's super in. late. Yeah. I should have picked him the round before. What was I doing? <laughs> yeah, he went in the 13th in the, the league I'm doing. I had him and, and Shota Imanaga queued up and they went the two picks before me and love love to get sniped in the 13th round mm. sorry chris lucas giolito has been diagnosed with a flexor strain and a partial ucl tear, tear in his right elbow season ending surgery is a possibility i'm thinking it's a little bit more of a you know probable outcome at this point unfortunately brutal news for the red sox who just signed giolito this offseason he was not drafted in <sighs> scott's tout worth draft here on tuesday night Updated Red Sox rotation, Brian Bayo, Nick Pavetta, Cutter Crawford, Garrett Whitlock, and Tanner Houck. Though they can easily sign one of Blake Snell or Jordan Montgomery, they have been linked to Montgomery recently. Um, yeah, bad news for Giolito. Uh, let, let's say they don't sign one of these pitchers. Any interest in a Whitlock or Tanner Houck who seems maybe more cemented in the rotation now? I think they're both interesting. Yeah. I think Garrett Whitlock is probably more interesting personally because I think there's a a better chance that his stuff plays up as a starter. Hauk is still sort of limited, I think, in terms of his repertoire. But we've seen, you know, pitchers with one really great breaking ball and then a pretty good fastball survive and even thrive as starters over the past couple of seasons. So definitely don't want to write Hauk off, but nope. Whitlock... And and this might just be me. I, I've always been really interested in Whitlock. He's got that really good changeup. He's he's had some really good moments uh, as a reliever, especially. And so I I'm interested to see what he does as a starter. He's got great control, quality of contact against him before last season had been really good. And so I I think if he can get back to who he was in 2021 and 2022, uh, I think Garrett Whitlock has some upside. How? Um, according to Alex Cora, the Red Sox manager, obviously, um, he said that no pitcher has added more velocity on the Red Sox this uh, coming into this spring than than Tanner Houck, and he's performed well. He had five strikeouts in three innings in his. I, I'm not sure if he pitched today, but his his prior outing. And, uh, you know, has had a 13% strikeout rate for his career. So I think there's, I think well, there's a lot to like there, but yeah, if they bring in Jordan Montgomery or something, it's back to being a competition between Whitlock and Hauk. All right, let's take our first break. When we return an update on Ronald Acuna right after this. The blackout mystery. Oh, welcome to March Madness. Oh, oh, you just never know in the tournament who is going to shine. Stream March Madness live on any device, anywhere, and be ready for anything. Welcome back in. Well, here's the update on Ronald Acuna. There is no update. It's just the same thing that we've heard over and over again. Well, that, that, that's, that's a little misleading. But the diagnosis was confirmed. Yeah. Yeah. That's basically it. He has yeah. irritation in the meniscus in his right knee. 
is expected to be ready for opening day. He went first overall in Scott's Tout Wars draft. This isn't just like water under the bridge. I do want to make that very clear. Like mm -hmm. there still is risk for re-injury at some point to this knee throughout the season. Maybe he doesn't run as much. Okay, he doesn't steal 70 bases. Maybe he steals 40 yeah. or 50 I, instead. I, I but... think it's pretty close to water under the bridge. As long as they don't bring him back too quickly. That would like, because there's not, it's not like this is like, this is something that should, should just get better within two or three weeks. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not lowering his salary cap value at all now. Remember we talked about the four different scenarios. Okay. It, these two scenarios, I might make it more like a $50 player than a $60 player, but no, we got the best case scenario. We got uh, just rest for a couple weeks and be ready to go. And um, as long as they allow it to heal and don't bring it back and, and risk an actual tear in the meniscus, then um, I don't, I don't think there's anything to worry about. I think it's, I mean, look, you're allowed to worry, but at, at, at some point you, you got a player who I've said before is worth two, two Austin Riley's. Um, I, I think you should stop sweating it so much and just enjoy putting your team together with Ronald Dacuni at the top of it. Did you guys see that he pulled like a Willy Wonka at camp today? Walked up to the, the trainers with like a, a limp, like using his bat as a cane and then kind of just started walking normally once he got closer to them. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, that's, got a sense of humor about it. That seems a little reckless, Chris. I, I don't I don't know that he should be playing around. Well, he didn't do he didn't do the the whole tumble and cartwheel that Willy Wonka did. So it's OK. <laughs> yeah, that makes it OK. Let's talk about Sonny Gray. He's been diagnosed with a mild right hamstring train and it would be, quote, challenging to be ready for opening day. Zach Thompson or Matthew Libertor could fill Gray's spot in the rotation while he's out. And we spoke about this on yesterday's podcast. We'll be dropping Sonny Gray down the rankings a little bit. Has has this changed anything for you guys, this diagnosis? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just I dropped him a few spots. Like I said, he would. I would. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad it's a minor thing. But, uh, you know, it's it's a good chance he misses a turn or two, right? So yeah. you gotta you gotta factor that in. Yep. Rangers manager Bruce Bochy said he's hopeful Corey Seager will get some at bats in the Cactus League before the end of spring training. Seager's been delayed due to hernia surgery he underwent in late January. So it's not really much of an update here. It's just mm -hmm. you know hope on the part of his manager. Dodgers manager Dave Roberts said that Walker Bueller won't begin the regular season with the Dodgers, but that the team hopes Bueller will start a Cactus League game. He was originally not expected to appear in any spring games, but perhaps there is more optimism now. So I don't know. Th this seems, yeah, I think optimistic is the right word. It's a little bit more than the Corey Seager report, I would think, with Walker Buehler. Yeah, I mean, I'm still not expecting him to pitch much in the majors in April, but, you know, now it certainly sounds like he's got a chance. But, you know, if he makes one Cactus League start, you think about the timeline, right? The spring training first starts usually come mid to late February, like 23rd ish for most high end pitchers. They're ready to go by, you know, April 20 or March 28th, whatever opening day is. Um, let's say he gets his first game in on March 22nd or 23rd when they get back from uh, Korea. That probably still puts him around late April as a return. And then that's pretty much how I'm treating uh, Walker Bueller that he'll he'll miss at least the first month of the season. Pirates top prospect Paul Skeens will begin the season in the minors, which we suspected. Jaron Duran mentioned this earlier, exited Tuesday's game with left ankle tightness, but the Red Sox expect him back in the lineup Thursday. Cedric Mullins is still experiencing hamstring soreness and may undergo an MRI to establish a baseline for the injury. Don't love that for Mullins. Uh, if he misses any time, we could see Colton Kowser early in the season with the Orioles, who I believe had another multi-hit game here on Tuesday. Tommy Edmond resumed playing catch and hitting off a tee on Tuesday. The plan is for Edmond to get back to hitting soft toss relatively soon, though a timetable for his return likely won't come until he faces live pitching again. Did you see if he's going to be swinging from both sides of the plate? I did not see that in the report. That was the, the thing that I read last week, that he was further behind from one side. I can't remember which one, but it was whichever one is more important for the risk that he injured um and like the the 
thought was he could have played in games with one of them from one side, but not the other. So that, that's the one thing I'm going to be keeping an eye on there. Braxton Garrett will likely begin the season on the IL due to left shoulder soreness. And apparently AJ Puck is a heavy favorite to open the season in their rotation. Scott took him in Tout Wars. I took him in TGFBI. So let's go AJ Puck. You so can that should mean Edward Cabrera has a rotation spot as well. I think there there's now with Braxton Garrett, it's Puck, Cabrera, and Trevor Rogers who made his debut today and looked good from, from what I saw. We didn't have stack cast data, but he, he hit 95 according to him. Uh, all three of those guys should be in the rotation to start the season. And I, yeah, I think Puck Cabrera and Rogers all have sleeper appeal. Yeah. There may be like, I know Ryan Weathers had a good start last time out. I've got a bunch of strikeouts there. There may be like a low percentage chance him or even Max Meyer could, sure. uh, if, if, if one of those guys really struggles, but those, those would be the three heavy favorites. I would assume to round out the Marlins rotation puck, Edward Cabrera and Trevor Rogers. Yeah. Re Weathers was really good again today Four strikeouts and four shutout innings. He does look good, man. And we were out at first pitch Florida last weekend and our buddy Nick Pollock was pretty excited about Ryan Weathers, who whose velocity is up the spring. And I believe he maxed out at 99 miles per hour mm -hmm. last week. Um, that are, wow. I didn't see. Yeah. That. He was averaging like 98. No, I think he 97, 98. Yeah. 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 Around there. 97. Yeah. Maxed out at 99. So Ryan Weathers, I mean, how can a team have this many interesting pitchers? Man, the Miami Marlins, they got it, dude. It's like stallions. Stallions They're back. back, baby. Uh, trade some of those guys for hitting, man. What are they? No, doing? don't trade any of them. They all have injury risk. That's true. Yuki Matsui threw a bullpen <laughs> session on Tuesday, his first since being diagnosed with back inflammation in late February. So a step in the right direction. And Anthony Rendon reported discomfort in his groin on Sunday and will be out through Wednesday. Well, the season is too long anyways. Lo love to see him getting some time off. Probably, probably good news for him. Uh, all right, I'm going to run through a bunch of notable spring performances that I wrote down here. I'm going to read off all of them, and then you guys can quickly react to one or two things because we do have to keep things moving. Jackson Holiday went three for four with a double and triple, three batted balls over 102 miles per hour exit velocity. He hit the double off of Zach Wheeler, and it nearly left the park. Nearly a home run off of Wheeler. Oh, My starting shortstop in both TGFBI and Tout Wars. Sorry, just wanted to put that out there real quick. The dynasty teams are back. Here, here goes Scott. <laughs> O'Neill Cruz hit a home run with a 115 exit velocity. Evan Carter, two for three with a double dong, five RBI, both off Logan Gilbert. Oh, I was leaving. They're, they're on my, he's, yeah, yeah, Evan Carter's on my TGFBI and Tout Wars teams too. Uh, yeah, I pause it just, just for Scott to okay. let us know about Evan Carter. Uh, Jose Barrios, three shutout innings with three strikeouts, threw a new cutter six times, which averaged 91.6 miles per hour. Uh, I think this is, is really interesting. I don't know if it's a good pitch yet. Obviously, it's a small sample size, but he throws his fastball around 94 miles per hour. He throws both his changeup and his slider around 82 to 84. So the cutter gives him a completely new velocity band to work in. And so I, I think that's a an interesting wrinkle for Barrios, who is probably still a relatively low ceiling pitcher, but it, it's interesting to see. Tyler McGill threw three no-hit innings with six strikeouts to two walks. He threw his new cutter 12 times out of 49 pitches, and he had 10 swinging strikes, three of which came on five splitters, a.k.a. the American Spork. Pirates pitching prospect Jared Jones threw two shutout innings and averaged 99.3 miles per hour on the fastball. He maxed out at 101. There is talk that Jared Jones could open the season in the Pirates rotation as their fifth starter. Has big stuff in the minors, but uh, bad command, apparently. And we mentioned Ryan Weathers, four shutout innings with four strikeouts. Uh, we didn't have... I don't think we had stack cast data in this game. No, we didn't. Because you mentioned that with Rodgers. Mm -hmm. But... Last week, the fastball velocity was up to 96.4, and he topped out at 99, like we mentioned. So lots of names here. Weathers, Jared Jones, Tyler McGill, Barrios, Carter, O'Neill Cruz, Jackson Holiday. Anything you guys want to quickly touch on? I think we pretty much covered what I have to say on them. I think Tyler McGill is kind of entering deep mm -hmm. league late mm -hmm. round territory sleeper appeal. I think Jared Jones is as well, if, if it looks yeah. like he's going to make the rotation for sure. All right, well, let's get back into our breakouts. And before we do uh, Breakouts 2.0, we'll quickly run through the names that we had in Breakouts 1.0 for those who might have missed them. And uh, Scott, 
you are up first. Give us the rundown, man. Who was in Breakouts 1.0? All right. Well, I already mentioned Tristan Casas and Seiya Suzuki were. Um, others on Breakouts 1.0, Royce Lewis, who, again, is, is probably priced out of where I'm going to draft him most likely, but I understand why, because, uh, you know, it's it's not just that he had uh, 15 home runs in his final 32 games, playoffs included. I mean, that's I think that's the starting point for it. But uh, in between all the injuries Royce Lewis has had, remember, former first number one overall pick here, Royce Lewis. So great pedigree. Uh, twice torn ACL, yes. But the consistency stands out to me. So um, over he made five total stops over the two-year period in between his two ACL issues. And um, I'm not sure I have this number right. Hang on. <laughs> I wish I was I wish I was looking over this when you were going through the news. Okay. Um, yeah, anyway, he just consistently hit 300 with an OPS over 850, is my point, throughout throughout his minor league career. And, um, and then obviously did what he did last year. So I think Royce Lewis is about to take off. There's Tarek Skubal who, of course, gained a, veloc a bunch of velocity last year, coming back like a mi mile per hour and a half on his fastball last year, coming back from the um, flexor surgery. And now his velocity is up even more in the spring, so look out. What he did with that velocity last year, 280 ERA, impressive enough, but 228 expected ERA and a 2 FIP. Those led all other pitchers with at least eight innings led all other pitchers by the XRA by 72 points and the FIP by 83 points. So Tarek Skubal was on a different planet from everybody else. Terrific strikeout rates, terrific walk rates, terrific job putting the ball on the ground too and limiting home runs. So uh, I've said a few times before, he is my favorite for AL Cy Young. He's my pick for AL Cy Young going into this year. We got the four standout sophomore hurlers, and you hear the most about Grayson Rodriguez and Yuri Perez and Bobby Miller. I would rank them in terms of order of preference, Perez, Gray Rod, and Bobby Miller. Um, but I think Tanner Bybee belongs in this group as well. Uh, Grayson Rodriguez, Bobby Miller, and Bybee especially finished the season on a heater on their highest note. I mean, their final numbers look solid enough themselves. I mean, Tanner Bybee actually had the lowest DRA of the four at 298. I do think he has the lowest ceiling of the four and Yuri Perez, the highest ceiling. That's why I rank them the way I do. But of those four, Bybee is being overlooked the most. Uh, O'Neill Cruz, of course, basically all the, the same points I was making for him last season prior to that gruesome leg injury. They, they still apply. He was kind of Ellie De La Cruz before Ellie De La Cruz appeared on the scene. Just off the charts, exit velocity reading, still the owner of the hardest hit ball in stack cast history is O'Neill Cruz and um, really cut down on his strikeout rates uh, for the little bit we saw him last year in the way we hoped. Actually, it happened in it started in September the year before. It got that strikeout rate closer to 30%, which somebody who hits the ball as hard as he does, that gives him the potential to, uh, to make a real impact in fantasy. Uh, Yiner Diaz taking over as the Astros full time catcher. And um, terrible at drawing walks, so I think that creates some skepticism within the analyst ranks. But you just look at his numbers as uh, as the second string catcher for the Astros last year: two eighty two batting average, twenty three home runs, eight forty six OPS. His final season in the minors, uh, Diaz had a three oh six batting average, twenty five homers, eight ninety eight OPS. So he kind of just translated that production to the majors, and I think it's I think it's basically legit. He's you know, kind of a kind of a weird profile with that microscopic walk rate, but I think for for catchers, as far as catchers go, there's a lot of upside there for Yiner Diaz, Noel V. Marte, who I took in Tau Wars today. Um, I was most impressed by him averaging 91.3 miles per hour uh, on exit velocities after getting the call last year. Um, his max exit velocity uh, two was. Um, you know, top, top 5% of the league. So he, he crushed the ball, did no LV Marte. And he also was six for six in stolen bases. So he showed in that short span of time, I think monstrous potential. I think he has the most upside of anyone, any of those up and coming Reds hitters other than Ellie De La Cruz. 
And so it's really just a question of how much playing time he gets at third base. There was a hamstring injury early this spring, but he seems to be past it now. And I think he's fine. Mitch Keller is a fun breakout candidate. Obviously, he you just look at the total numbers. He collapsed in the second half last year. ERA finished at 421. But if you look at the game log, there were so many starts of his that were legitimately ace caliber, the kind of starts that are only accessible to aces, going seven innings, no runs, double-digit strikeouts, two hits, blah, blah, blah. He had four starts. They all came in the second half, but four starts all year, seven earned runs or more. If you take those out, Keller's ERA drops from 421 to 313. I'm not saying he'll never have a disaster start this year, but maybe it'll be one or two instead of four, and his numbers will look a lot better. He'll, he'll look like an ace. Uh, Cabrian Hayes finally did the thing we were all wanting him to do last year, uh, last uh, two months, actually. Um, his fly ball rate climbed to 41.5%. His pull rate uh, climbed to uh, 35.4%, both well above his career averages. And lo and behold, he had 10 home runs in that two-month span. If he can keep that going, Cabrian Hayes might be he might be like a 30-15 guy, 30 homer 15 guy. Best case scenario, but it's possible. Ryan Pepio with the improvements in control last year, 1.4 walks per nine compared to 4.4 walks per nine the year before. Obviously, the Rays, an organization that knows pitching well, saw fit to acquire him this offseason in the Tyler Glass now deal. So Ryan Pepio, I think, is a breakout. And last one here. Last one. Jared Kelnick. The Braves got him. They went, they jumped through a lot of hoops to get him, took on a lot of salary that they then had to spin off to other teams. And they say they want him to play every day this year. He improved his splits drastically against left-handed pitchers and against sliders last year, the two big knocks on him previously. Um, you know, still a lot of strikeouts, but a lot of upside for Jared Kelnick and a lot less pressure with the Braves. Great supporting cast. I could see it finally happening for Jared Kelnick this year. Scott, that was an incredibly thorough breakdown of your breakouts 1.0, and I do appreciate it. But I really just wanted you to list them all <laughs> and, and say like 10 seconds for each player, and you did like a minute for each player. <laughs> but wow. here we are. Uh, we, we still have to get to breakouts 2.0. Chris, do you want to quickly list off your breakouts 1.0? I'm sorry. Or should we just get into it? Uh, well, no, I, yeah, I'll, I'll run through them real quick. Royce Lewis, O'Neal Cruz. Uh, Tarek Skubal, Grayson Rodriguez, Yuri Perez are all also on my list uh, in overlapping with Scott. I have Bo Naylor um, on my breakouts list. I think he could be the next kind of JT Romoto, like five category star at the catcher position. I think he's got that kind of upside. Riley Green, he's my player that I love. I think Nick Castellanos with a dozen steals might be the upside here. And he's already, uh, I believe, playing in games this spring. So that's a good sign. Yoshi Yamamoto, I don't know if like we can actually count him as a breakout, but you know, it's an opportunity to talk about him. He might just be the best pitcher in baseball on a first round on a on a per start basis. I have him and uh Tara Skubal as kind of long shot first round candidates for 2025 in a column I wrote this week. So th those are my breakouts one point. All right, I'll quickly mention mine. Uh, Bobby Miller, the same as, you know, all these guys. Um, you know, he's on a lot of breakout lists this year. He is the one I like most. I, I think he's probably the most refined of the the break of the second-year pitchers and plays for the best team. So I'm in on Bobby Miller. Uh, Jackson Trio and Wyatt Langford, I guess kind of cheating. Like, they haven't played yet, so how could they be breakouts? I just think that they could provide excess value and be potential league winners where they're going in drafts. Michael King, we've talked a lot about. Jake Berger, the, the hitter that Scott loves, wound up with him on his tout word draft. Hits the ball extremely hard and obviously made some big improvements in Miami last year. Logan O'Hoppy, big power from the catcher position. Just need him to stay on the field. Did you see that, that report that Ron Washington said he wants him to play 135 games? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, between 125 and 135 mm -hmm. games. So could be a huge year here for Logan O'Hoppy. Jaron Duran, we talk a lot about, think he's going to lead off for the Red Sox and has a little bit of power, lots of speed, assuming that. The, uh, the toe and the ankle are okay. Uh, Brian Wu, the pitcher I love this year, higher swinging strike rate on his fastball last year Woo. than Spencer Strider. Woo, let's go. Uh, Brandon Fott made some adjustments when he returned, looked really good in the postseason. Emmett Sheehan, maybe a back off a little bit. He still is not throwing. He's dealing mm -hmm. with general soreness and might be delayed mm -hmm. to the start of the season, but 
really flashed some massive swing and miss down the down the stretch last year. And if you're in a deeper league and you need pop later on, Nelson Velasquez and Matt Walner. Let's take our final break. When we return, we'll run through some breakouts 2.0 and we'll wrap up with Scott's Tout Wars draft right after this. CBS celebrates Women's History Month. Welcome back in. Here we go. Breakouts 2.0. We'll just uh, each cycle through here. And Scott, hit us up with a an addition. I know you haven't wrote it yet, but who are you planning to write about for Breakouts 2.0? It's true. I haven't written it yet. Uh, I will say real quickly, since they were both in your 1.0, I guess I'm catching up to you guys now. Bo Naylor is uh, in my Breakouts 2.0. And um, I think part of the reason he doesn't get hyped as much as as maybe the Francisco Alvarez's and uh um Logan O'Hoppies of the world is because it really took him a while to get going last year but over his final 28 games Bo Naylor hit 321 with seven home runs four stolen bases and exactly the same number of walks as strikeouts 16 in 28 games that's some really good production from any position, much less from a catcher. He is, he's kind of overtaken Mitch Garver, I think, is my, my, uh, my favorite catcher to draft, particularly in one catcher leagues where he's often available in the very last round. And because his plate discipline's so good and because he's a catcher who can steal bases, I think he's a great fit in both points and categories league. Um, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and talk about Jake Berger a little bit here as well. Um, he always had monstrous power. Uh, some of the hardest hit balls in all the majors. And it, it was just, he struck out too much. So he's a very one dimensional hitter. Wasn't was struggling to get full time at bats with the lowly white Sox. Um, but he goes to the Marlins. He hits over 300. He cuts his strikeout rate way down from that uh uh i don't have the rates available here but it was like it he cuts it from like 30 percent to 22 percent mm -hmm. and his batting average goes from 214 with the white Sox to 303 with the marlins maybe it's just you know a two-month fluky thing that kind of happened he actually made he, he actually made an effort to to tone down his swing because he realized he was overdue it. He didn't need to swing that hard to, to hit for power. And sure enough, even with that toned down swing, even with the exit velocity, the, the average exit velocity lowered a bit with the Marlins. 11 of his 17 hardest hit balls last year came with the Marlins. So it really didn't compromise his power. It showed he could be more than a one dimensional hitter. I think it's possible. Jake Berger hits like 275 with 40 home runs. And, uh, he's, third base being as deep as it is, he tends to go like around 13 of 12 team leagues, 12, 13, something like that. So uh, always happy to wait at third base and part you know just so I can get Jake Berger. You know what comp comes to mind? And and it might, might sound like damning with faint praise, but I think he was actually a really, really good player for a decent amount of time is Mark Trumbo. You know, remember he was often a batting average liability. He had one year where he hit 268 with 32 homers had that 47 homer season, which that would be ridiculous if Jake Berger got anywhere close to that. But that's the kind of player I can see Jake Berger being where, you know, Trumbo for his career hit 250 average 32 homers per 162 games. I, I think that's a, a reasonable comp. That's that's basically who Berger was last year. Mm -hmm. I, I think if those changes to his swing hold, he can do better than that batting average wise and still put up the huge power numbers. That's that's part of the reason I'm so high on him. I, I think the more likely scenario is the one you laid out, mm -hmm. but I think there's a chance he exceeds it. The ADP for Jake Berger, 166.6 as the 17th third baseman off the board. Something to consider in points leagues. The plate discipline is pretty bad. He does not walk much and he strikes out quite a bit, though he did lower it when he was with the Marlins last year. So keep that in mind. With Bo Naylor, the ADP 238.4, 15 points off the board. Uh, has been dealing with some back spasms, but he did catch a simulated game last week. So the hope is all right, he's being built up, and it doesn't sound like he's in danger of missing opening day, but just keep that in mind, and we'll play it by ear with Bo Naylor. 
Chris, let's go over to you. Maybe uh, throw us a few breakouts, 2.0. Yeah, Nolan Gorman is a player that I'm really starting to talk myself into. I think it's kind of a 30-homer floor for him with, I mean, he could be like second base Kyle Schwarber in a best case scenario. I really think his, his swing is really, really tuned to maximize power in a way that makes a 40 homer season a live possibility for him. It, it comes down to playing time, I think, but last season he had an 841 OPS against lefties. His quality of contact numbers were very good. His strikeout rate was actually lower against lefties than it was against righties. I really don't think this is a guy who should be platooning. I think Nolan Gorman should and and will be playing every day this season and I think the the upside is incredibly high. You know, he was a little up and down, started off strong, went into a slump, finished really strong before what was the injury that he suffered at the end of last season? He dealt I think it was like he had a hamstring and then I think he had a back. He's had a back issue that's been bothering him since 2020 at a weightlifting accident. Mm-hmm. But I read that he changed his nutrition this offseason to try and help alleviate those yeah. concerns. So, so yeah, I, I think the the upside is super, super high for Nolan Gorman in, in a way that like he might just be the the best power hitter at the second base position this season. I also and have Brian Brandon Hayes. Lau, right? I think Brandon Lau's right there, but I, I, yeah. I think uh Gorman has more raw power no, he, he, than Brandon yeah. Lau. Um at third base, I I added Cabrian Hayes to my breakouts 2.0. Everything Scott said about him starting to elevate the ball. I think the other thing, and, and this is kind of, you know, more of a scout slash eye test thing, but I've always really liked betting on a, a guy who is as good defensively as Cabrian Hayes is and has the physical tools to be a really good hitter. Obviously, you know, I'm, I'm not going to bet on, I don't know, Christian Pache to figure it out because he doesn't have the the same physical tools maybe as a hitter, but Brian Hayes has always hit the ball really hard. He's always made a lot of contact and it's just been elevating and pulling the ball. And that's what he started doing last season. I I think he's just a real good ball player. And then that's a profile that I think it makes sense to bet on. Uh, Do you want one more move on? Let's see. Uh, Well, you have Jaron Duran on the list. We talk yes. about him a lot. Anything quick to make you've kind of become the Jaron Duran guy. You're you're drafting him everywhere. I legitimately think he has 20 home or 40 steal upside. Jaron Duran does. If he stays healthy, if he plays every day for the Red Sox, there are some questions about both, certainly, but he's gonna hit leadoff. He had 12 stolen bases in 36 games out of the leadoff spot for them last season. His average his max exit velocity uh was actually quite good, and I think his hard hit rate. Uh, was like 70th percentile uh, for Jaron Duran. Yeah, so 112.6 mile per hour average max exit velocity. That's like 80th percentile. Average exit velocity above average at 90%. Like He's not just a slap hitter. This is a guy who, who I think legitimately has potentially 20 homer upside. At the top of a lineup, that could be... Jaron Duran could be a legitimate four-category contributor and a top 25 player in fantasy. So I... I I really like him as a breakout candidate. I acknowledge there's some risk. Maybe I should probably stop taking him 150th <laughs> when his ADP is like 240 or whatever, but I uh, I really want Jaron Duran on as many teams as I can. His ADP is 200th, by the way. Yep, on the rise, Chris, and I, I've seen him go higher than that. Maybe you're uh, helping contribute to that ADP uh, moving up a little bit. Did want to quickly ask about Q. Brian Hayes. The ADP is 187.2. Mm-hmm. Same exact ADP as Noel V. Marte. Chris, who would you rather have? I have Q. Brian Hayes one spot ahead of Noel V. Marte in my third base rankings. I would rather have Q. Brian Hayes just because I have real concerns about Noel V. Marte opening the season at AAA. I think at this point, you know, we've talked about like Jackson Merrill. I think it's better than a coin flip chance. I think it's probably worse than a coin flip chance for Noel V. Marte. Maybe he's 40% to make the opening day roster. I think it mostly depends on like whether Jonathan India and, and Matt McClain can get and then stay healthy. But, so I, I, I actually am not even factoring. I, 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 I guess I, you know, all, all the roster projections from the beat writers and everything show Noel V. Marte on the roster. So mm-hmm. I, I'm not going to say there's zero zero percent chance he's not on the roster, but I, I think they have I think they've made room for him to be on the roster. And obviously, the way he performed late last year, mm-hmm. uh, I'd be kind of surprised if they sent him down. So I'd I'd rather have Noel V. Marte between those two to answer your question. 
Um, well, he's a rookie. Of course you would. <laughs> I, I mean, there, I, there may be something to that where, you know, it's, it's just, he hasn't let us down before. And so if he, he could be one of those rookies who explodes on the scene, mm -hmm. um, and those might be more worth pursuing in shallower leagues than deeper leagues as a general rule, the upside play. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's where I stand on those two. Like them both, but generally going to prefer Marte. All right, Chris, I completely agree with you on Nolan Gorman. I wrote him up in breakouts 2.0. Another hitter I had was Kerry Carpenter is ADP 225.6 as the 54th outfielder off the board last year, hit 278, 20 homers, six deals and 118 games. He was 65th percentile or better in exit velocity, barrel rate, and expected slugging. Had a massive year in the minors back in 2022, where he hit over 330 homers, a 1025 OPS. I think the Tigers are improving. I think they're going to be better as a team, mm -hmm. obviously getting some more sluggers into that lineup. Hopefully, uh, Colt Keith hits the ground running. Kerry Carpenter needs to improve against lefties to like reach his ultimate ceiling. But even if he's just a platoon player, I think... He can have like a Eddie Rosario type season, like the better Eddie Rosario seasons where he hit like 275, 25 plus homers and 10 steals. I, I think we can get that outcome here from uh, Kerry Carpenter in 2024. Let's wrap up with a few uh, pitcher breakouts because I feel like we haven't touched too many on those. Uh, Scott, do you have any pitchers you plan to add to breakouts 2.0? Yeah, Kyle Harrison. Uh, he, he kind of did the you sound same. so excited. <laughs> well, I just, I'm realizing I'm not going to get a chance to talk about Jonathan Aranda again. And I love him so much and I never get to talk about him, but that's fine. Kyle Harrison. He did sort of the same thing. I talked about Joe Boyle doing except over a, a longer span of time. Uh, walks were the big issue in the minors. He was considered an elite prospect unlike Boyle because the walk rate wasn't so ridiculously bad. And the strikeout rate was like 15 K per nine. Um, he got to the majors and he was throwing 65% of his pitches for strikes, which is good. Uh, and it actually started his last three starts in the minors too. So it, it's, it's something that he sustained for a while to end last season. Now the strikeouts weren't off the charts in the majors. And it seemed like there were some concerns that developed about his off speed arsenal. But I've always said that the, the, Biggest indicator of upside for a starting pitcher is whether they can miss bats with their fastball. And Harrison's fastball is tremendous as far as that goes. Um, he's put in some work on his secondary arsenal this offseason. It seems like it's gotten good reviews in camp. And the G Giants are slotting him in as their number two. So they're ready. They're, they're saying he's ready to go. I think he's being downgraded too much for his minor league walk issues that he may well have overcome. All right, Chris, let's slide over to you. Breakouts 2.0. You have uh, four pitchers on the list. If you want to give a quick thought on Bobby Miller, Cole Reagans, Chris Sale, and Mason Miller. Yeah, I mean, Cole Reagans, I think you can listen to literally any podcast since like last August and hear the breakout case for him. We all love him. We're all expecting big things from him. 243. FIP over his final 11 starts once he got to Kansas City. He pitched like a legitimate ace. Um, Bobby Miller weirdly didn't get a lot of strikeouts in the majors, only 23.6% strikeout rate. It was 29.9% in the minors, but you look at the arsenal and it looks like every pitch should be able to get strikeouts. So I'm betting on the stuff winning out. I think he could absolutely be an elite strikeout pitcher through 138.2 innings last season. I don't really see any reason why Bobby Miller couldn't get to like 175 even on the the Dodgers with the way they handle their pitchers. So I think there's a chance we're talking about both Cole Reagans and Bobby Miller as top 10 starting pitchers next season. The other two, Chris Sale. Um, he's made 31 starts since coming back from Tommy John surgery in 2021. Now that's 31 starts over three seasons. That's not great. But 393 ERA, 1.185 whip, 182 strikeouts and 151 innings work. If that's all he does this season, he's a significant value and a must-start starting pitcher uh, for the 2024 season. I don't think that's the ceiling. His velocity has ticked back up this spring. He's pitching in a great situation in front of a very good Braves team. He's going to have a chance for a lot of wins. I think he's just got to stay healthy, and the good news is he's currently healthy. So I think 
Chris Sale, I know he's like 36 years old or whatever, and someone's going to be like, oh, you can't call him a breakout. Yes, you can. He's going to re-break out. That's the whole point. It's fine. These are arbitrary labels. Chris Sale can be a breakout. I, I called him a sleeper, but that's fine. Yeah, I, I define sleeper as like outside the top 250 in ADP, so I I, I, I won't okay. include him there. But, but yeah, whatever you want to call it, I think Chris Sale is a good value who's likely to outperform his current cost. And then my last one is Mason Miller, who I, I think people might start to cool on him because they've said he's not going to be their closer from day one. They want to test him out in high leverage situations. Let's make no mistake about it. If Mason Miller stays healthy, he is going to be the athletics closer. And it's just a question of whether it happens before the end of spring training or before the end of April. I think it's probably sooner rather than later. I think before the end of April, Mason Miller will be saving games for the Oakland Athletics. And now they may only win 50. So there won't be a ton of opportunities. But I think Mason Miller could just be one of the best relievers in baseball, full stop. He is, he averaged 98.3 miles per hour, working primarily as a starter last season with his fastball. He was above 101 miles per hour nine times in his spring debut last nine week. He hit 103. Times. He has 107 strikeouts in 72.2 innings as a professional. He has only thrown 72.2 innings in like three seasons, I think. That is a concern. Staying healthy is a concern. If he stays healthy, I think Mason Miller is going to be utterly dominant in a way that few relievers are. So even if he only gets 20 saves this season, I think he can be a top 10 relief pitcher in, in fantasy. Fun with small sample sizes. Mason Miller has thrown two innings this spring in two different appearances. Zero hits, zero walks, five strikeouts. I, I just... 16 I, pitches. 16 strikes. <laughs> I don't think you can overstate how how dominant Mason Miller could be as a reliever. Yeah, he could just be awesome. A few pitchers here for me. Gavin Williams uh, as the 51st starting pitcher off the board. He's kind of the forgotten mm -hmm. former pitching prospect. He looks like an ace. Six foot six. He throws 96 miles per hour with the fastball. Two strong breaking pitches with the slider and the curve. Both get whiffs and both do a good job limiting hard contact. Read an article that he's been working on his changeup to help against lefties. Uh, gets a good amount of whiffs. 12% swinging strike rate as a rookie. Needs to improve the control. Four walks per nine. 10.7% walk rate uh, was in the 20th percentile. So that's why he ranks a little bit lower than the other second-year starters because we, st we still need to see that improved control. But massive upside here, I, I believe, from Gavin Williams. Same thing with Brian Bayo. Former top pitching prospect. Nasty sinker changeup combo here. Gets a lot of ground balls, 56% ground ball rate. That was third highest among starting pitchers with 150 innings last year and has been working on his slider with Pedro Martinez this offseason. And uh, that that's probably the piece. That's the, the, the key to the puzzle here mm -hmm. for uh, Brian Bayo. I think he kind of wore down last year too. His first 14 starts, a 304 ERA, a 119 whip. Second half, 549 ERA, 149 whip. So a young pitcher, hopefully the stamina is improved and he can – carry that throughout the course of the season, but I, I do like Brian Bayo quite a bit. If you haven't learned by now, we're going to go a little bit long in this podcast because I do want to give Scott his due, and we will talk about his Tout Wars team. It's my ready? fault. I talked too long about Breakouts 1.0, but <laughs> just, yes, Tout right. Wars. I should have been a little bit more clear. Let me pull up your uh, your draft board here, and let me get rid of this uh, this thing in the top right so people can see your team which is all the way on the right side of the screen so this is the tout wars online draft obviously a snake draft one of the longest running industry leagues some of the best players out there 15 team five by five roto with obp instead of batting average scott was drafting from the wheel 15th overall and at pick 15 scott you started with Garrett cole and matt olsen two mm -hmm. questions is that what you were expecting and why not Jose Ramirez or Bryce Harper to pair with a medals? That is exactly what I was expecting. Those two players. When I said I, when I signed up for pick 15, that's what I had in my mind. I wore my Matt Lana shirt here in anticipation of taking Matt Olson there. And I want a Garrett Cole if he lasted there. And was no guarantee. I probably would have gone Olsen and Bryce Harper, actually, if, if, if Garrett Cole didn't make it to me because I wanted 
there are only so many opportunities to grab those big OBP guys. I feel like it's essential with an early pick. Um, and so that's what I wanted. The reason I wanted it, the ace with him, because, you know, uh, people listen to the podcast a long time. know that's not my general strategy to, to take a pitcher as high end as Cole. But I think in these 15 team leagues, uh, the there's so much, there's so many more people picking and so many more people who need a starting pitcher at any given moment that it's really hard to do my intended strategy of taking four in the like 12 to 30 range. It just, they go too quickly for, for that to happen. And so if I'm, if I'm going to have to settle for three of my top 30 rather than four of them, then I feel like I need one of them at least that's higher in than that. And Cole seemed like the safest way to do that because otherwise I'm waiting 30 picks till I get a chance to pick again. And all the high end starting pitchers could be gone. Now it turns out they weren't this time, which is why Tarek Skubal ended up being my third pick. So Cole Olsen and then Scoobal. It was just obviously the best player left on the board, particularly in a 15 team context like this, knowing what happens to starting pitcher. So I felt like I had to take him. And then I went uh, with Trout, Mike Trout in round four. I could have gone CJ Abrams if I wanted to address the speed need. And I probably would have, if it was a conventional Roto league with, with batting average instead of on base percentage, but CJ Abrams is like a 300 OBP guy. And there are other opportunities for steals. I think, I think steals are available for longer than quality outfielders are. So I, I thought it was more important to get the outfielder there and trout, but yeah, through four rounds, I basically have no speed unless Ron Washington gets his hmm. way and uh, Mike trout starts running again. Uh, he, he could, he could steal a hundred. That's what Ron Washington said. He, he, and, and, you know, Trout didn't shoot it down necessarily. So you never know. I always I'll say settle stolen, for 10. stolen bases are a matter of intent. Ron Washington's trying to push run you guys. Uh, maybe Trout will buy in. I don't know. But it is worth noting. I, obviously, you don't draft him with that expectation. Trout was still 96% on sprint speed last year. Exactly. He has not really he lost. Steal a 100 step. if he wants to. Yeah. Absolutely. Could steal 100. I want to ask, Scott, so you took uh, your first five picks. Get your guys, by the way. I mean, you got uh, you got Tarek Skubal at the end of round three. You got Cole Reagans at the end of round five. Yep. So three, three pitchers in my first five picks, and I think that's worth stressing because I'm the only team of these 15 who took three pitchers, who had three pitchers after, uh, after five rounds. Um, hmm. If you're just talking starting pitching. I, right. I think there may be some if you include closers who did. In hindsight, what would you have? What do you like more if you started Olsen and Harper? And then at the turn, at the three, four turn, you take Scooble and one of, I don't know, let's say Framber Valdez or Tyler Glass now, or the way you kind of played it out where you took Garrett Cole and then instead you got Trout at the three, four turn? Well, it depends when you're asking me. Because if you'd asked me when Tarek Skubal, when I was taking Tarek Skubal in round three, and it's, I, I was thinking, oh, I wouldn't have gone Garrett Cole if I knew Tarek Skubal would be there. But if you ask me at the end of the draft, knowing what happened to starting pitcher apart from those first five picks, then, uh, then I would say I'm really glad I took Garrett Cole. Because basically, yeah, I take those three pitchers, my first five picks, Cole, Skubal, and Reagan's feeling great about my pitching staff, but no, I have a lot of ground to make up in the hitting categories. And I kind of just ignore pitcher for a long time and, and probably for too long. And, you know, I, I, I referred to it earlier, maybe ignore isn't the right word, but every time I was thinking of taking a pitcher, I'm like, all right, this is the time I'm going to grab my number four guy. He would go and I'd be like, crap, I don't want to reach for that starting pitcher. So I should just continue to take the hitters I like. And that happened from round six through 18, uh, 18. Yes. I, I think the one was Zach Geloff. I you took him with the first I, pick Zach of the 10th round. The first pick I was really excited about because I so, needed steals and I needed second baseman. I'm just looking at the guys who went right after him. Okay. Chris, Chris Sale, Sale, Mitch yeah. Keller. I know you like them both a lot. Yeah. Um, All right. So yeah, that that was the one that stood out to me. Sale, yeah, I I debated sale. So um, okay, so let me just build up to the picks before this. So Reagan's was round five. 
Evan Carter, round six, good OBP guys. Values elevated in this format. Jackson Chory on round seven. That was my first big steals threat. Carter should give some, but I, I needed to make up a lot of ground there. And yeah, so I got three starting pitchers and three outfielders through my first seven picks and then Matt also in the first baseman. So yeah, I, I've hit the I've hit the scarce positions that I want to hit. And I kind of ignored both after that. Um, so round eight was Paul Seawald had to get in the closer chase there that always happens in these deep roto leagues and then nine and ten i'm picking the back to back there vinnie pasquantino is there um that's pick 135 obviously obp specialist no way he should be available that late in this format so even though i had a first baseman i feel like pasquantino was a, a layup there and then geloff yeah i needed all the speeding all the speedster second baseman were gone and speed was arguably my biggest categorical need at that point so it felt like a slam dunk too i hated to pass up chris sale because it was value but look i got three big strikeout pitchers i it didn't feel urgent at the time it felt like i would be overdoing that uh that part of my team um i think the bigger time when i i i re- the one i'd like to have back uh is 11 so we go through 30 more picks after Geloff comes to me again. I don't have a third baseman yet. Jake Berger is there. One of the players I love, right? Got to take him. Um, I, I kind of felt like I might be falling behind in the power categories too, even though I had Olsen and, and Trout just because I took so you so many of my early picks on hitters on, on pitchers. But I was, I was, I was unsure because Berger's obviously not a good OBP source. If he hits over 300, okay, the OBP would be fine, but he's probably not going to hit for a batting average that high. doesn't walk much. Um, he should give me a power boost, and I needed a third baseman, so I was like, eh. Felt uneasy about it, but I went ahead and took Berger and paired him with Jackson Holiday, who you know looks like he's going to be on the opening day roster and should be a great OBP guy in addition to other things. Um, I needed a shortstop. I thought he was clearly the best one left. So I'm not regretting the holiday pick, but the burger one, I thought, do I really need to take burger? Is this really optimizing the pick or should I go with Chris Bassett here? Chris Bassett just seemed like the perfect pitcher to round out that staff, to really solidify it as the elite staff in the league um, because he excels at the things maybe the other three I took struggle. He's not the big strikeout guy they are, but good whip source, good win source, considering Scooble pitches for the Tigers and Reagan's pitches for the Royal. It just seemed like the right fit, um, but I didn't. And uh, and again, that continued to happen throughout the draft. And, and what made it hurt all the more taking Berger that era in round 11 is that I still ended up with no LV Marte in round 14. If you told me that was going to happen and I wouldn't like any of the pitchers available in round 14, well, then of course... I would have taken Bassett over Berger, but you don't get that foresight and you don't know what the other 14 teams are going to do. And it turns out they just, they mostly kept taking pitchers trying to catch up to my early advantage there. I don't know. Um, And so my next starting pitcher, my fourth taken was Kodai Senga in round 13. Could be a a, a terrific number four, but when is he going to be back? And then, uh, I don't take another starting pitcher again. So that was Senga in 13. I don't take another one until, uh, when is it, Frank? Eric Fetty in round 19. Yeah. So Eric Fetty, at least at the start of the year, will be my number four. And that's a little scary. And then AJ Puck will be my number five. I do take Scherzer, who hopefully will be back on the early side of June. And there may be a point this season where I got Garrett Cole, Tarek Skubal, Cole Reagans, Kodai Senga, and Max Scherzer are all going for me, which will be amazing. But of course, attrition is a thing at starting pitcher. And um, there's a good chance that doesn't happen too. So I, I just, you know, and other pitchers I got. So yeah, we mentioned Fetty and Puck. I got uh, Joe Boyle, who I like the upside, but there's a lot of downside there too. Kyle Hendricks is like, the, I wanted more of those like stabilizing innings eater mm-hmm. types who just weren't going to kill me in ratios since I got great strikeout guys at the top, but they just, everybody else took them before I could take them. And that's, did you, when you took Senga, did you uh, give any consideration to taking Justin Verlander or do you have Senga ranked ahead? Well, I, I guess you, you have him ranked ahead because you took him ahead. Yeah, I did. <clears throat> uh, I, and I could have gone back to back there, I guess in retrospect, I would have preferred if I did, but I, you know, um, 
I well, I don't think you could take both. I just taken an injured pitcher, right? Yeah. I'm not nearly as stressed about taking injury players. I mentioned at the top in, in tout wars as I am in, in uh, TGFB. It's so weird in those NFBC leagues where you don't have IL spots and s- your bench could just fill up so quickly. Mm-hmm. If you're, if you're taking guys who are injured in the first place, of course, more of your players are going to get injured and you could really put yourself in a corner that way. That's not an issue when you got infinite IL spots. I actually think the injured guys tend to be undervalued, which is why I ended up with a couple of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, other injured guys, I took Tommy Edmond for not taking speed in my first five rounds. I think I actually wound up in a good spot there with stolen bases, but Edmond's not going to be available at the start of the year. He's filling my fifth outfield spot. So I'm going to need to pick up somebody there. Just like I'm going to need to pick up one pitcher. I got Robert Stevenson. I didn't get a true second closer to go with Paul Seawald. So Stevenson is my best bet for saves. Otherwise, there's a good chance he begins the year on the IL. Um, you know, I, I got bench bats that I really like, Jackson Merrill, Michael Bush, and Jonathan Aranda. But I needed pitchers more at that point. And it's just, I I, I never, <laughs> people kept taking him and I couldn't. I don't know. I, I had to reach at some point and I guess I wasn't willing to. And that's the, that's the always the trap of picking on the end, especially when it's a league as deep as 15 teams. That's exactly right, Scott. And I felt that in my TGFBI league where I'm picking 14th out of 15 teams. Mm-hmm. And specifically when you're picking on the ends in leagues that deep, you, you kind of just have to throw ADP out the window and just think more about, okay, what, what kind of run do I think is going to happen? W- which is hard to predict, but you mm-hmm. might have to pull somebody up the board just to make sure you either fill a categorical need or a positional need. Mm-hmm. You know, if you need the pitching, you, you might just have to pull them up. And that's kind of the game that we play when you're picking on the ends in a league that deep. Can uh, I ask you uh, one quick question, Scott? Yeah, sure. Did you give any thought to Esther Ruiz at four, in the 14th round? Not a one. He lasted <laughs> so much one. longer in this draft. Yeah. In my, in my Tout Wars draft, which is also OBP, um, he went in the 10th round. He went 14.3 in this one. I know there are limitations to his game. I know the OBP will be pretty bad. That's a really good price. Yeah. Now, I I hope that the person who drafted him, yet Ellie De La Cruz in the third round, that's probably overkill between the two of them just because OBP could be really tough for those two guys. Yeah, already getting so many steals. But yeah, I, I don't think I wound up in a bad spot with steals, like I said. And and I've had so much trouble the last two years in this league keeping up with runs and RBI. Like I do mm-hmm. well in home runs, but I'm near the bottom in runs at RBI that I didn't want to stock my roster with too many estuary Ruiz types sure. who are just gonna help in that one area. So I I get what you're saying, but it wasn't for me. And uh I that's not a pick I really regret. Uh, a couple other things I wanted to raise here. So I took Eloy Jimenez in round 17 just because he lasted that so long. Love it. I already had Noel Vimarte yeah, really in my like utility it. spot at that point. So that that was an example of like, ah, I wish I could have found it. Like, okay, so I take Bassett instead of Berger. I got Marte at third base, and I just slot El- Eloy Jimenez at utility. There's a chance Eloy Jimenez earns outfield at some point, and that could help with my need there. They're talking about he'll he'll play right field sometimes this year, but I don't know, I don't know how soon that's going to be that he earns it. Um, JP Crawford in round eighteen, OBP Great specialist, yeah, 380, 380 OBP last year, so I think he's a good choice, and I think it was a good Jeremy Pena went with the next pick. I'd much rather have JP Crawford in this format. My catchers were my very last two picks, Jake Rogers and Travis Darno, so I went total dumpster dive there. And I think I think that's a viable strategy if you're not getting the prices you like. I mean, it's it's hard for any catcher to make that big of an impact. And in a league this deep, you're gonna have you're gonna have a couple positions that just aren't really pulling their weight. I'd rather it be catcher than most any other position, I would say. Um, and then there's one other point I wanted to make. Oh, is this? So, uh, as I said, the draft's playing out. And um, I'm I'm queuing up starting pitchers I like, and they keep going before they get to me. And I keep always thinking, okay, well, the next time I'll grab a starting pitcher, the next time. 
And I, I think one of the ways I got in trouble here is just the speed of the draft. And I remember I had a similar comment last year. There's a minute long timer, which is fine. It's what I'm used to. But so many of these drafters took so little of that one minute <laughs> that it was hard for me to just keep up with crossing off names as they're making these picks. And so I didn't get a lot of time to kind of anticipate my pick or to think it through. I'm on the clock and suddenly I only have a minute to decide each of them. And I took close to a full minute every time. Um, and so I, I think part of my issue was I was not seeing how quickly those globby starting pitchers, and I mean globby in a good way this time, I, I would have, I could have stood to have a couple more globby pitchers to just kind of keep me safe there. Um, and I couldn't, I, I was not seeing in the amount of time I had how quickly they were depleting until it was too late. So I wish I had one or two more of those. I especially wish it was Chris Bassett. Trades are allowed in this league, and I'm seeing other teams have some corner infield needs here that maybe I could work something out. But um, yeah, if I if I just had, like really, if I could just go redo that burger pick and put Bassett instead, I'd feel so much better about my team right now. It could still work out great, but like I'm counting on Tarek Skubal and Cole Reagans being healthy and dominant all year. And if they aren't, then I could run into some issues. I just realized that while I had the draft board up on the screen, it was kind of like cut off and I didn't scroll down. So people couldn't see like the back half of your picks, but we mm -hmm. talked about all of them. I will put a link to the draft board in the podcast, in the YouTube description, if anybody wants to check it out. And Scott, I assume that you will be writing an article recapping. Your I will probably saying a lot of the stuff I just said. <laughs> All right. So you don't you need will... to bother with it, but just, uh... just, just click on it and click on it anyway and leave it up on your screen for a while and then close it out. That that'll that's fine. Do it that way. Make sure to read the article. We're going to wrap there for Scott and Chris. I am Frank. Thanks as always for tuning in to Fantasy Baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. And we'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.